All right. Let's look at arc tan. All right. So if we write y equals arc tan of x, this means, well, it means that tan of y is equal to x. Okay. And just like we did with sine, we have to give an interval for, for y, right? Um, what angles are we going to consider? And if you remember what the graph of tan looks like, something like this, again, you see that it's certainly not one to one, right? It, this, this thing repeats itself over and over and over again, okay? Um, and if we kind of stick to these principles that we would like to keep the first quadrant from zero to pi over two, and if possible, we'd like to kind of keep one solid piece for the domain, for the range, um, then it makes sense to once again take the portion between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, just like we did for sine. The only difference being that, of course, uh, tan is not defined at the endpoints of the interval. We have those vertical asymptotes. So this time we take the open interval. OK. Very good. So where do we go from here? Well. Once again, from this equation, tan y equals x, we can take the derivative of both sides using implicit differentiation. Um, or, or if you like, you can use that f implicit function theorem formula, um, whichever way you want, right? So if we said, you know, we could say like this, so g prime of x, right? Um, so if we said that, uh, if we said that f of x is tan x, right? then the, the inverse function theorem formula says that g prime should be 1 over f prime of g of x. OK, so what is that? Uh, oh, what's f prime? f prime, you'll remember, derivative of tan is secant squared. OK, so it's secant squared of arc tan of x, or if you like, secant squared y. Okay. So what do we do with that? Well, tan y is equal to x. Now remember that um, we know that tan squared y plus 1 is equal to secant squared y. That's an identity that we have, secant, secant, right? And tan y is x, right? So this is just x squared plus 1 is secant squared. Well, that's exactly what we want. 1 over 1 plus x squared. And there's our derivative. Again, it's a rational function. It's a little bit surprising that the derivative of an inverse trig function gives you something in some sense, much simpler, right? 1 over 1 plus x squared is the derivative of arc tan. Um, if you want, you can take the approach we used last time, right? Take the derivative of both sides here using implicit differentiation, secant squared y times y prime will equal to 1. Divide by secant squared, you get down to here. The hard part is figuring out, well, what do I do with secant squared y, right? So that's where you remember, OK, so let's see, what was y? y was arc tan, so tan of y equals x. Tan squared plus 1 is secant squared, so now I know what to do with my secant squared. Okay. The derivatives of the remaining four tri inverse trig functions follow the same sort of approach. Right? Um, the only thing that you have to keep your eye on is, is making sure that you have the right domains for your definitions, domains and ranges. Right? Get this bit straight. Um, for cosine, for example, cosine, the correct range is from 0 to pi for the inverse cosine function for arc cos. Um, and again, this is making sure that you have one quadrant where it's positive, one where it's negative. Um, and the signs will work themselves out there as well. Everything kind of goes, goes as you'd expect. Um, the only ones that get a little bit tricky uh, are the inverse secant and inverse cosecant functions. Um, you can take a look at those in the textbook. Uh, the derivatives get a little bit complicated. Um, and one of, the, one of the additional complications with those 
is that there are two competing definitions for the inverse secant function and the inverse cosecant function. Um, so, you know, th there's this sort of semi-arbitrary choice that you make, right, when you're choosing this range, when you're choosing the quadrants that you want to have as outputs for the inverse trig functions. You, you got to make some choices, right? Most people agree you should include the first quadrant. Uh, and then you got to pick another quadrant where things are negative. And, and for sine, cos, tan, it's kind of obvious what choice you should make. Once you get to, to the inverse trig functions, or inverse secant, inverse cosecant, it's no longer so obvious how to choose that quadrant where it's negative. And some people choose quadrant, let's say, 2. Some people choose quadrant 3. You're going to find both choices, those two different definitions. And the interesting thing there is that depending on how you choose that definition, it actually affects the formula for the derivative of those functions. Um, so you might encounter different formulas for those derivatives if you're looking at different textbook sources um, or different online sources. You'll probably find different answers, and it depends on these choices that you make when you define the inverse trig functions.